Hey guys, today we're going to be looking at Craig Breedlove's original Spirit of America jet car and tracing its evolution from Craig's original idea in around 1959 to the final Spirit of America jet car that actually broke the record in 1963. It's an interesting story because it sheds light on the thought process that goes on in the development of a land speed car. That's coming up. As always, before we get going, don't forget to subscribe to this channel if you like this kind of content. And throw a comment down below. Let me know what you think. Okay, so here's Craig's Spirit of America jet car, as it looked on August 7th, 1963, when he broke the land speed record. Now, let's roll the clock back four years, to 1959. Craig is sitting around in the Costa Mesa Fire Department, where he's working as a fireman. That's how he supports his family. And he's reading about Mickey Thompson building a car called Challenger to go after the land speed record. And he has kind of a revelation. Mickey is just a regular guy, like Craig. He's a working stiff, wife and kids, works at the Los Angeles Times running the color press. And yet here he is going after the land speed record. Not the Class B coupe record, or the Class A streamliner record, or whatever, but the ultimate land speed record. Craig suddenly realizes that if Mickey Thompson can do it, why couldn't he? So right there, in the firehouse, Craig decides to build a land speed car. Craig's first idea had nothing to do with jets. He was going to use an Allison aircraft engine, a piston engine. He figured that Mickey Thompson's approach of using four car engines in his Challenger racer, one for each wheel, was just way too complicated. Four engines, four transmissions, all that stuff, that's too complicated. A lot of trouble. That's why Craig hit on the idea of using an Allison engine, like Walt and Art Arfons had been using in their green monster dragsters going back to the early 1950s. And Allison had even more power than four car engines put together. And it would be a whole lot simpler to build and run. So this very first idea of Craig's, it would have looked something like Athol Graham's City of Salt Lake Streamliner, or Art Arfon's Anteater Streamliner, when Art started getting into land speed, both of which used Allison engines. But this Allison idea, it didn't last long. Craig scrapped it and started thinking about jets. Why? Well, a jet has even more power than an Allison engine, and it uses thrust so it's simpler. There's no transmission at all. No gears. All that power is being blasted straight out the tailpipe, too. It's not being directed through the wheels. It's not turning the wheels. So you don't have to worry about wheel spin. All this stuff is great. But it wasn't what first turned Craig to jets. What he was really thinking about was money. There was a market for surplus Allison engines back then. They were being put in hydroplane boats and stuff, so they were kind of expensive. We're talking about maybe $2,000. A lot of money back then. A half a year's pay. But a surplus jet engine. The only market for those was as scrap. So you could pick one up for maybe 500 bucks. So that's why Craig first turned to jets because they were cheap, something he could afford. The benefits of a jet, pure thrust, uh, simplicity, no transmission, no wheel spin, that was just gravy. Craig bought his first jet around 1960 before he had a finished design for a car. His first idea was to build a jet car with a side saddle cockpit, a cockpit on one side where he'd sit, 
and an identical cockpit on the other side to balance it out. This way he could keep the car low to the ground, not much more than chest high. If Craig had gone ahead with this idea, Spirit of America would have looked similar to Art Arfon's Green Monster. But he didn't. A new idea cropped up. One of Craig's friends, Bill Moore, was working at this time as a graphic artist at Hughes Aircraft in Los Angeles. Bill is sitting in the cafeteria, talking about this far-out jet car that his friend Craig is going to build, and one of the engineers that works at Hughes, he starts giving Bill pointers. The guy says that Craig should go with a three-wheel configuration, and he makes a little sketch on a napkin, a single wheel in the front to keep the nose small, and two wheels in the back, set far apart on outriggers. That's the best aerodynamic configuration, the engineer says. Maximum stability, minimum drag. So Bill Moore takes the napkin sketch to Craig. Craig likes the idea and runs with it. His land speed car is now looking like this. This is an illustration that Bill Moore made for Craig. It's starting to become recognizable as Spirit of America, right? Especially that nose. Okay, now we're getting on into 1960. This new car design of Craig's is going to require air ducts. And they need to be precisely designed to ensure perfect airflow. Craig is referred to a guy working at Lockheed named Walt Sheehan, who agrees to help him. This is a major stroke of luck for Craig, because Walt Sheehan is the real deal. He's one of the designers of Lockheed's F-104 Starfighter. He designed the air ducts, and now he's going to do the same thing for Craig's car. So Craig is getting the very best help. Now here's the interesting thing. Around the time Walt Sheehan comes on board, Craig makes another radical change in the design of his car. It goes from this to this. Look familiar? That's right. Spirit of America. By this time, Craig has come up with that name, Spirit of America. It looks an awful lot like Walt Sheehan's F-104. Okay, now it's 1961. Craig reads a story in a car magazine about how a local engineer named Rod Chappelle has been helping car builder Chet Herbert design a cutting-edge dragster by testing different configurations in a wind tunnel to find the perfect aerodynamic design. Craig immediately latches onto this idea. This is what he wants for his spirit of America. Wind tunnel testing. Irrefutable science. So he goes to see Rod Chappelle and takes along the model he now has built of his car, Spirit of America, in its F-104 configuration. Chappelle looks at the model and says, Sure, I'll help you build your car, but not this one. The problem, he said, was that it looked like it was designed to go supersonic, which wasn't the best configuration for the lower speeds Craig was shooting for. 400, 500 miles per hour. A rounder nose and smoother lines would be better. So Spirit of America gets redesigned yet again, based on Rod Chappelle's initial assessment and then wind tunnel testing, which reveal that the tail fin isn't needed, that it only causes extra drag. Notice the fin, the canard, under the nose. This was part of the radical steering system that Rod Chappelle developed for the car to get around the problem of there being not enough room in the nose to make the front wheel turn. After Rod's redesign, the nose wheel is fixed. It can't turn. At lower speeds, Craig would steer using differential brakes on the rear wheels. Then, when he got up over 150 miles per hour or so, and there was enough air resistance, he would switch over to steering using the steering yoke, which controlled the fin under the nose. Notice, too, how the nose droops down a little. This was to give the car some downward pressure to keep it on the ground. In around the middle of 1961, 
when Craig started building a full-sized mock-up. The nose was still looking like this. By the time actual construction on the car started, though, this idea had been discarded. Wind tunnel testing had shown that a straight nose configuration was better. Okay, so now it's August 1962. Here's Spirit of America on its first trip to the Bonneville Salt Flats. Craig is confident he'll break the record. But instead, it's a disaster. The car won't steer. Craig is turning the yoke from lock to lock at over 200 miles per hour, and it's doing nothing. This causes a major problem between Craig and Rod Chappelle. Rod keeps saying, it has to work. You have to go faster. Craig tries, but it's no good. He effectively has no steering. He finally has to give up and go home. It's hopeless. Only then, as they're loading the car back onto the trailer, is it discovered that the steering fin had been locked the whole time. It had been locked in place for the trip out to Bonneville, and no one had thought to unlock it before Craig started running. Fortunately, Craig gets one more chance. His sponsor, Shell Oil, agrees to back him for another try in 1963. First, though, they bring in some outside engineers to assess the car. At the very first meeting, Rod Chappelle defends his radical steering system, explaining that there just wasn't enough room in the nose to make the front wheel steer. And one of the engineers, a guy named Bernie Pershing, he speaks up and says, well, why don't you just use a focusing link? And Craig and Rod, they look at each other and they say, what's a focusing link? So right there, the steering issue is resolved. Spirit of America is given a steerable nose wheel, with the nose fin left in place to assist. Craig also wants a tail fin to be put on the back, like his original idea. By this time, he's lost confidence in the results of the wind tunnel testing. Rod Chappelle continues to insist that the tail fin isn't needed, but Bernie Pershing backs Craig up with irrefutable science. Bernie says the car is fundamentally unstable without a tail fin, that Craig likely would have crashed if he had gone much faster than he did. So that took Spirit of America to its final configuration. Steerable nose wheel and a tail fin. On August 7, 1963, Craig drove it to a new land speed record of 407.45 miles per hour and made it look easy. The results of the return run and the computed average of the two runs would be relayed from the timing shack in a few moments. With 388.47 clocked for the first run, Craig would have to have done at least 408 to better Cobb's average by the required 1%. I knew I had gone over 400 miles an hour. In fact, I was asked, how fast do you think you went? And I said 425. 428.37 and the land speed record returns to America. The official average speed of the two runs was 407.45 miles per hour for the measured mile. At the same time, new records were created for the five mile run and for the one, five and 10 kilometer course. Craig Breedlove had built his dream car and guided it across the face of the earth faster than any man had driven before. Whatever follows, whatever the future holds, this was his moment.